If you would get your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. I heard about a woman who wanted to have her portrait painted. She had decided she was going to have her portrait painted. She hired a professional artist to do that. And she, she got her hair fixed just right. She got a makeover, actually. And she, she, got a, a, she wore her favorite dress, the one she wanted to be in the portrait that was going to be in the living room. And, and so she's all ready. And the, the painter is ready to paint. And, and uh, she said, uh, well, now, let me mention one thing before you start. I want you to paint me with big, large diamond rings, a diamond necklace, emerald bracelets, a ruby brooch, and a gold Rolex. And he said, but you're not wearing any of those things. She said, I know that. But in case I should die before my husband, I'm sure he'll remarry, and I want his new wife to go crazy looking for all of the jewelry. <laughs> and so today we're talking about hypocrisy. <laughs> Romans 2, I'm going to ask you to stand one more time in, in reverence of God's word. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. Romans chapter 2. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest, for wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest do, doest the same things. But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that, which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judgest them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of the goodness, uh, of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? But after thy hardness and impenitent heart treasurest up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. I want to bring a message entitled The Hypocrite's Judgment. The Hypocrite's Judgment. And if you would be seated and then get your bulletin out, and on the back you'll see an outline. Have you heard the term playing possum? Oh, you're just playing possum. Well, if you're from the country especially, you know this. I know it firsthand. You come across a possum. Let's say it's laying in the middle of the dirt road, and it's just laying there, and you, you go to it, and, and you would, you're positive it's dead because its tongue's sticking out, its eyes are open but they're they're you know they're in the back of his head and and he's stiff as a board and i mean you're positive he's dead you walk away and watch he'd just get up and walk right off the road he's just playing possum and uh and so, let me give you one more illustration if you ever visit king tut's tomb in the egyptian museum inside the coffin is another coffin that's covered with gold leaf. And in that coffin, there's another coffin, a third coffin. And then in that one, there's a fourth coffin that's made of gold. And in the fourth uh, coffin is the body of King Tut. And of course, the body is wrapped in gold cloth and a, that awesome gold mask. But if you remove those clothes and mask, you would just see an old, dried, withered, dead corpse. What you see is not necessarily what you get. The outward thing doesn't change the inward thing. And, uh, and so we're talking about hypocrisy. In our scripture, Paul knew there are certain religious people that would listen to him if he's talking about the sins of the heathen. And they would pay attention. Matter of fact, they enjoy that. They like that. And the reason why is because they don't think it applies to them. They're indignant about the sins of other people. But they're indulgent when it comes to their own sins. And I th I'm afraid sometimes we're the same way. But look at verse 1. It says, Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judges doest the same thing. So we better be careful about judging other people. 
Because if we judge other people according to this scripture, we're condemning ourselves. We can all be guilty of excusing our sin. Our sin's just not as bad. You know, my sin is just not as bad as your sin. I've seen some of your sin. Your sin's way worse than mine. I mean, we kind of we tend to think that, you know. Ours is just not that bad. But God is saying it's time to examine ourselves. You might have heard of the guy that went to the psychiatrist's office. And he had made an appointment, and he comes in. And when he came in, the psychiatrist said, you can be seated right there. And so he sits down. He has scrambled eggs on his head. He has strips of bacon around his ears. And he sits down, and the psychiatrist, of course, is shocked. But he says, how can I help you? He said, well, I'm here. I'm not here to talk about myself. Uh, I want to talk about my brother. I think he's got some kind of problem. The Lord said, get the beam out of your own eye. Get that log out of your own eye before you try to get that little speck out of your neighbor's eye. We always want to dig on the neighbor's speck, their sin, and excuse our own. And the reason we do that is because we tend to measure ourselves by other people. Well, I'm better than he is. I may not be perfect, but I'm a whole lot better than they are. And we tend to do that. Someone wrote this. Faults in others I can see, but praise the Lord, there's none in me. So we're talking about the hypocrite's judgment. What is it going to be based on? And I want to give you three things according to the scripture that, that Paul wrote. Number one, the hypocrite's judgment will be according to truth. This is very important. Look at verse 2. We are, but we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. We live in a day when people are hiding the truth. They ignore the truth. Um, they don't even believe, to be honest with you. A lot of them don't believe in truth. Here's what they believe. They believe, well, this is my truth and it's your truth. And we have our own truth. And, uh, and yet, <laughs> they're being hypocrites to do that. The hypocrite, the hypocrite means play actor. In Jesus' day, uh, they would have the theater, the amphitheaters and things like that. And they would, they would come out. And of course, they didn't have the close-ups and the screens and all those things that we have today. And they would wear masks to, to portray whatever character, you know, that they wanted to and, and, and what kind of mood they were in. For instance, the mask, the big mask that everybody could see may be angry. It's an angry mask so they could see that, oh, this character is angry. And then they come back a little later and they're, they're happy. And so they've got a happy mask uh, or a sad one or whatever. That's what they did in those days. They were wearing disguises. And, and let me, I will say this. We all have some hypocrisy. So let's be real today. We're all hypocrites to a degree. All have a tinge of hypocrisy. Uh, for instance, have you ever known or heard of somebody like this? They're fussing and fighting all the way to church. I, I know y'all probably couldn't relate to this. And then you get out of the car and you walk in and you put on your happy smile and act like everything's fine when you're really, really angry inside. But you act like everything. Or somebody says, you know, they ask, uh, yeah, how you doing? Oh, fine. And the truth is you're depressed, you're down, you know, you've got a myriad of problems and, oh, fine, everything's fine. It's a little bit of a hypocrisy there. I was thinking about a, a Andy Griffith show that you probably remember because most people have watched Andy Griffith. If you haven't, shame on you. But uh, it was when Barney was deciding to, to dabble in real estate and he's trying to get Andy to sell his house and you he buys this these people's house and they sell theirs and buy theirs and so boy he's got it all worked out Andy really wasn't too excited about it but all of a sudden in the evening Andy gets a call and says uh they're going to come look at your house oh no 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 not tonight not tonight oh no, no they're on their way they'll be there in five minutes 
What? And he hung up the phone, and Andy and Aunt B and Opie start grabbing everything and throwing it in the closet and putting it under the, the pillows and, and trying to get it. Andy even shoved Opie in the closet, shut the door, you know, trying to get everything. And then the doorbell rings, and they just act like, well, come on in, like everything's fine. We, we all do stuff like that, right? There's a little bit of a hypocrisy there. We want people to think we're a little smarter than we are or stronger than we are there's but but listen those are all minor things that's not what this scripture is talking about this is talking about spiritual things this is talking about pretending you're right with god pretending that you have a good strong relationship with god for some it's pretending they're saved when they're not it's a very, very serious thing that he's talking about. Jesus is going to uncover. He's going to remove the disguises someday. There will be no pretense, no performance. Truth will be the standard. I believe it was Abraham Lincoln who said, you can fool all of the people some of the time, some of the people all of the time. You can't fool all the people all the time. But I really wish he would have said it this way. You cannot fool God any of the time. Most important thing of all, because he's going to be the judge, not the people that are looking at us or listening to us. He'll judge. So it's more than just knowledge. There's been articles written. Matter of fact, I, I, I looked this up. In 1945, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. Every 25 years, all that man knew was doubling. Every 25 years. And then it got to where it was down to 14 months. Knowledge is doubling every 14 months. And now the latest, they believe that knowledge doubles every 12 hours. Now, I'm not here to debate that. But I will tell you, knowledge is increasing. And we know that because Daniel in the Old Testament told us in the last days that knowledge would increase. And in 2 Timothy 3, there's a commentary that, that's kind of sad because it says men are ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's a difference in knowledge and truth. See, God's standard is not mere knowledge. It's truth. And, and again, people don't like that. I've seen, I've seen people, uh, I've seen some uh, uh, people asking others, you know, is this true or what is truth? And, and they don't want, well, there is no absolute truth. If you say there's no absolute truth, listen, you just denied this word. Amen. That's what you did. Because we stand on this. Amen. If I say that Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation and there is no other way. All I'm doing is saying what he said, and I'm standing on the truth, the truth of the Word of God. And people just, they just, just don't use the Bible. I'll use the Bible. I'm thankful for, the, for God's Word, and it is truth. God has written the Bible, and you know, it's called the Word of Truth. He's given us the Holy Spirit, and he's the Spirit of of truth God is building his church and the church is called the pillar and ground of truth God gave his son and his son said I am the truth John said I have no greater joy than this that my children walk in truth folks we need to get serious about truth it is about truth God's word is true the hypocrite, the play actor, he's mistaken if he has this idea that it's what's on the outside. It's what people see. That's what matters. No, it's what God sees. Hold your place. Put a, put a, a bookmark there in Romans 2 because we're going to come right back to it. But turn to Matthew. Turn back about four or five uh, books to Matthew 23 because Jesus addressed the topic that we're, we're looking at this morning. Matthew 23. Matthew 23, let's see what Jesus thinks about this, this thing of hypocrites. 
Matthew 23, look at verse 25. It says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you make, the cl- make clean the outside of the cup and platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. The hypocrite, the church hypocrite, would say, well, at least, Pastor, I've never committed adultery. But Jesus said, you ever look at a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. (laughs) Well, I've, I've I've never murdered anybody. But Jesus said, whosoever hateth his brother. I've heard Christians say, I hate them. I hate them. And there's nothing you can't, I'll always hate them. Well, the Bible says you hate your brother, you're a murderer. That's what the Lord Jesus taught. Well, at least I go to church. Uh, That's commendable. But Jesus said if you worship, you must worship in spirit and in truth. Did you know you can go to church and not worship? Positively so. You can, and I mentioned this a week or two ago, you can be right in the midst of people that are praising God and worshiping and, and you're not doing that. You can go through the motions, but it's not doing any good because the Lord is zeroed in on your heart. He knows where the worshipers are. Makes me wonder how many people in this room are truly worshiping the Lord, not just going through the motions. There's another, there's an, so again, we need to examine ourselves, examine our motives. Why am I here? Why do I do what I do? Why do I give? Why do I serve? Why do I come to church? But there's another mistake I want to mention that hypocrites make, and it's a serious one. Well, I must be doing things right because God's blessing me. I mean, I've got my family's going well, my job's going well, I've got money in the bank. God just keeps blessing me. So evidently, this that I know I'm not doing right, but it must not be a big deal to God because he keeps blessing me. And, you know, preacher keeps preaching about this, but I do that. I do it. And he keeps blessing me. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 5, 45, that the blessings of God fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. The blessings of God fall on the just and the unjust. So that's certainly not a litmus test to see, am I right with God? Because he's blessing me. See, he's blessing me because of him. He's blessing everybody. Listen, God's blessing the atheist right now, today. He's blessing the, 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 the adulterer, the murderer, the people that we would consider horrible sins. But he's blessing them. So why is he blessing everybody? Seems like he would just lower the boom on those that are living in sin and, and, and others, you know, he would just bless us, but he wouldn't be blessing them. Why does he do it? Look, you're back in Romans 2. Look at verse 4. There's a purpose for the blessings, and here it is. Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? He's, he's blessing you and me and others to bring us to repentance. Now, it doesn't always work because we don't repent sometimes. But his blessings are being poured out so that we would repent. Repent of the world, repent of the flesh, repent of any other way except the Lord Jesus and follow him, right? Think about Sodom and Gomorrah. We know what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah. God destroyed them. But did you know that they were at an all-time high economically when God rained fire and brimstone? They were doing real well. 
the Bible says that they were experiencing the fullness of bread and idleness. Well, what does that mean? That means they were, they were doing real well. And they were doing so well, they didn't even have to work. That's, that's Sodom and Gomorrah. The fullness of bread and idleness. God was blessing them, but they wouldn't repent. God blesses us so that we will repent. It doesn't show that we're right with God. It's so that we'll repent. Has God blessed you? Say amen. amen. Then the result would be to live for him. It's to repent of, of self and, and the world and the flesh and live for him. So the hypocrite's judgment will be, make no mistake about it, according to truth. Number two, it'll be according to deeds. It will be according to deeds. Look at verse 6. Who will render to every man according to his what? His deeds. God is going to render every man according to his deeds. Every man, woman, boy, or girl. Now, we're not saved by works, but we will be judged according to works. And somehow, sometimes, we tend to think that's for other people. Maybe it's because we're from America. And we've just been so blessed. It's for other countries. It's for somebody else. But God's going to judge every, everybody. Look at verse 11. You ought to underline this one. There is, there's no respecter of persons with God. There's no respecter of persons with God. Now, what does this mean? It means this. Whether you're a Jew or you're Gentile. Whether you are red, yellow, black, white, whether you're from this country, that country, or this state, or that state, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, whether you've been in church all your life or you never go to church, we're all guilty. We're all guilty. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous. No, not one. You ask, go out there right now and you ask a hundred people, do you, feel, do you feel like you're a good person? You're going to have a hundred people say, yeah, I think so. Why? Because they're trying to do good. And, and they're measuring themselves according to other people. So, yeah, I think I'm pretty good. I'm not the murderer. I'm, I don't steal and I don't whatever. So I'm pretty good. That's, that's people's response across the board. They do believe they're pretty good. No, no, no. Here's what you are. You're the same thing as me. You're a sinner. You're a sinner. And so what, what does that mean? Well, the wages of sin is what? Is death. And that's eternal death. That's eternal separation from God. The wages, your payment, what you're going to get for your sin. No matter how bad or, or you think they are. We're all in the same boat. We need a Savior. We've got all kinds of sins. Sins of commission. Sins of omission. Sins of the Spirit. Sins of the flesh. Secret sins. Sometimes we sin and we don't even realize we're sinning. And, and, and it's, you know, you could take somebody that's real respectable, what the world would consider a very good person. But did you know that unless they've been saved, they're in the same boat as the atheist or the agnostic or the terrorist or the person who hates God? They're in the same boat. God's no respecter of persons. Nicodemus is a good example. Nicodemus was morally, civically, religiously an outstanding man. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, except you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. People say, well, I, my, my grandmother's the sweetest person. She don't believe, but she's the best person you ever, you'll ever meet. I hate to break it to you. But if your grandmother doesn't repent and turn to Christ, she'll perish. We don't like to think that way, but it's true. No matter who it is. The hypocrite's judgment will be according to deeds. And number three, the hypocrite's judgment will be according to the gospel. To the gospel. Look at verse 16. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men... By Jesus Christ, according to my gospel. So, what is his gospel? 
What is his gospel? I bet you everybody in here could, could say this. Here it is. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's the gospel. That's his gospel. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if that gospel doesn't save you, it'll condemn you. You're going to be judged according to the gospel. You're going to meet Jesus Christ. You'll either meet him in salvation or you'll meet him in judgment. And I want to close with this. There's an interesting phenomenon in skydiving called ground rush. Basically, it's like this. And when you're trained to do some skydiving, you're going to know about this. And you need to know about this. Basically, it's this. When you jump out of the plane, in just a matter of seconds, you're, you're headed to the ground at 120 miles an hour. But, if you're, again, if you don't know, if you're not aware, you would, you would be positive you're not falling. You're just hovering like there's an updraft there that's, that's just holding you. And, and you haven't started falling. You're just hovering. The wind has got you stationary, and you're not falling. But if you fail to pull that ripcord in time, you'll, you'll die. It's very serious. But I'm afraid that, that that's people's view of the spiritual life. For example, and, and I don't know why all. I don't know, I don't know why all. The, maybe it's the familiarity of the churches. We've got churches on every corner. We've, we've the familiarity with God's word. We've got Bibles, multiple Bibles, some people in the same house. They're everywhere. And we've been to church so many times. We've had so many altar calls and invitations. There's been so many times I'll get another chance. I'm, I, I've got plenty of time. I'm young. I'm very, very young. Teenagers have that. Young adults think they're going to live for years. But if you wait one second too long, you'll perish. You'll perish. Did you know that? There's a second that you better not cross or you'll perish. Likewise, if you wrap yourself in the self-righteous robes and you think you're okay and you're good enough, you'll perish. There's none good enough. No, not one. You know, you may meet some people and you want them to think you're a little smarter than you are. And you, you know people, and you want them to think you're a little stronger than you are. A little more talented than you really are. A better person maybe than you really are. But folks, when it comes to the spiritual life, don't do it. Don't be a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite. Because God's looking at the heart. And, and when we're talking spiritually, we're talking with it about eternity. It's too serious. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Don't be the spiritual hypocrite. I hope you'll examine your own heart this morning. Make sure that you're, you're right. As best you can, you're right with God. First of all, that means I'm saved. I believe with all my heart I'm saved. I've repented. I've turned to Jesus. I've put my faith and trust in him. I've been born again. And then it means that I'm living for him. Don't be the spiritual hypocrite. If you need to make a decision, I'm going to be here at the front in just a moment. And I'll be glad to pray with you. Our, our altars are open if you just want to come pray. Maybe you're looking for a church home. If this is where God wants you to be, don't, don't wait. Don't delay. Maybe you want to rededicate your life. Whatever God wants you to do, just be obedient. Bless Lord, in this invitation time, in Jesus' name, amen.